And now for our interview with Green Bay Packers legend, Paul Horning. So who recruited you to Notre Dame? Was that the Gipper, or you're not that old? <laughs> I hope not. No, um, <laughs> frankly, he was a coach at that time, and he, of course he was coming off some sensational, successful careers. And uh, I actually wanted to go to Kentucky. I love Bear Bryant. I got to know Babe Pirelli. He was kind of like my idol in high school. And uh, I really hadn't thought about Notre Dame until they got into the picture. And uh, my mom, uh, being a very uh, strict Catholic gal, she really wanted me to go to Notre Dame. So uh, back in those days, there were the days where athletes, uh, you know, they went to the college that their parents picked. And that was the case for me. Um, you know, I wasn't unhappy with it, for heaven's sakes, one of the great places of all time. But I got to know Babe Pirelli and Bear Bryant. And uh, uh, Bear Bryant cleared the way with Adolph Rupp. He was the coach of basketball. I wanted to play basketball. I was all state in basketball two years. And um, <laughs> I don't know if um, Coach Rupp. Uh, Really like the idea of giving to me a chance to play with the basketball team, but I think Bear Bryant asked him to, and uh, he said okay. And when I met with Coach Rupp and Coach Bryant up there, I kind of decided I was going to go to Kentucky and try to play football and basketball. But uh, my mom wanted me to go to Notre Dame, so that was case closed. Were you better in basketball than football? No, I was better in football, of course. And, okay. Uh, so you made the right choice. As yeah, far but you as know, if you, grow, if you grow up in Kentucky, basketball is really the number one sport. Always has and always will be. You know, and uh, um, we were we went to the state championships my um, senior year, and I, I was all state my junior and senior year. So I wanted to play, and I did play a year at Notre Dame. I played when I was a sophomore. Uh, I made the team and was going to play my junior and senior years. And Terry Brennan, the coach of Notre Dame, said, Paul, you know, it's too important for you to maintain your grades. And if you play basketball, it's going to take you away from your studies. And i really appreciate it if you didn't. So uh, I gave up basketball after my sophomore year at Notre Dame. What position didn't you play at Notre Dame? I see you played fullback, halfback, safety. You were yeah. quarterback. You know, I uh, I played quarterback my senior year all the way. I didn't play halfback or flank or anything. But uh, you know, I was I was a real good uh, I think a defensive football player. I was a safety. I led second in the team in tackles, first in interceptions, and I, I played sixty minutes. Those were the days when you played sixty minutes if you played offense and defense, of course. And um, I enjoyed both both parts of the game. Um, uh, we were two and eight, for heaven's sakes, and that uh, was was the only really bad uh, point of the, my four years at Notre Dame. I have to remember that. And um, uh, Terry Brennan, who was a coach, you know, uh, I, they let him go a couple of years after that. But I think that season was dominant in the thinking as far as Notre Dame was concerned about keeping a coach. Now, you were recruited by Frank Leahy. I'm sure you look forward to playing for Oh, him. absolutely. Absolutely, I did. And I had, you know, the first day I was there, he called me up and he said, I want this guy to take you over and practice kicking. And it was Johnny Lujak, for heaven's sakes. And what a <laughs> thrill. You know, here I was. Uh, and then he had Lou Grosey in there with, with some kicking drills that, that came in from Cleveland. So um, I was just ecstatic, for heaven's sakes. And to know that on my freshman team that I was going to be tutored by Johnny Lujak was was very, very important. Uh, you know, I've become great friends. And, uh, you know, he still shoots his age in golf, this guy. He's unbelievable. <laughs> He's a hell of an athlete. Um, but I enjoyed it. I joined my four years in Notre Dame. Wouldn't take him back for anything in the world. Who gave you the nickname the Golden Boy? Uh, Tommy, um, oh, uh, Tom Fitzgerald, who was a writer for the Courier Journal, nicknamed me that he saw me. In the, so I had a real good day in the spring game against uh, the seniors and the veterans and uh, from, from the pro league would come back. And uh, I was a sophomore quarterback 
Guglielmi was to be the number one quarterback with Tom Carey, who is now president and owner of, of uh, we all, in fact, we almost played in the Illinois Derby in Chicago, and he runs that whole joint. That would have been something. Uh, he was, uh, I was a sophomore, and Guglielmi and Carey were seniors. And uh, we almost went to the Illinois Derby with my horse, and then we decided to run in the Derby trial and try to get in the Derby. In fact, we were offered a, a shot at the Derby on Monday because we had three defections uh, uh, in the Derby. So here I was all my life thinking about the Kentucky Derby. Never missed a derby since 1963 when I was suspended. Lombardi said, there's one place I don't want you to go is the derby. And that's the only derby I've ever missed in my life, I guess. And um, But anyway, here I was with this kind of a question put to me. Do you want to go to the derby? Hell yeah, I want to go to the derby. But, you know, I got the greatest trainer in the world, Wayne Lucas. He said, say, I listened to him and he said, Paul, this horse isn't ready. And uh, I agreed with him. I said, you know, we'll wait a couple of weeks and see what happens. So we have decided to go on and be in the Preakness. Being born in Louisville, are, do you become a fan of horse racing at a very early age? Oh, my God, sure. I worked at Churchill Downs when I was a kid. You know, I was lied about my age, became a Andy Frayne usher. Uh, I made uh, $800 an hour. Uh, and then we went down in the grandstand, three of us, and when they said they're off, everybody stood up. We stole all the julep glasses. <laughs> took them outside and sold them for three three bucks. And we'd make about $100 on Derby Day. That was sensational back when I was a kid. How good How good was Man of War? I'm sure you saw him race. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to kick your ass when I see you. <laughs> but, uh, but horse racing has been my game. You know, my God, I live here. I grew up here. I was there yesterday. And... Um, um, I go to the races maybe two, three days a week still. Now, in 1956, Notre Dame has a an illustrious 2-8 <laughs> season, and you, and you win the Heisman. You're the only Heisman winner from a losing team. That's true. Yeah, you, Were you, there? Was you it, know what was I you or... I said, you really got to have some talent to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, the question is, is the talent on the field or is the talent in, in the uh, sports information office? Or how, oh, how screw, screw the sports information <laughs> office. You guys, uh, most of you don't know a goddamn thing about football. <laughs> <laughs> now, you want to answer another question? <laughs> Was that your highlight of your college career winning the Heisman? Oh, sure. That's, yeah, no, it's never been done and probably never will be. And uh, uh, I was in the top, uh, I don't know what it was, I can't remember, four or five when I was a junior. So I was kind of like the favorite. Jim Brown was right there with me. Uh, let's see, who else? Uh, uh, I can't think now, but Jim Brown was, the, the, he got the highest votes as and, you know, behind me when I was a junior. So we were the, kind of the top two that they thought were going to be uh, John Brody and Len Dawson. Uh, out of the top ten, Tommy McDonald and Oklahoma. Oklahoma was sensational in those days. Uh, out of the top ten football players uh, that came out of uh, that year when I was a senior, I think, all of them are in the College Hall of Fame, and eight or nine of them are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, it was a pretty good year, you know? Yeah, the 57 College All-Star game, they had you on the team, Jim Brown, Jim Parker, right. Brody. Arnett. Yeah, Parker, Parker is the best offensive football player of all time. What made, what made him so good? Oh, my God. Back in those days, now you got to understand, he's 325 pounds, and he'd outrun half the backs on Baltimore's team. <laughs> you know, I mean, he had tremendous speed. And, of course, I'm prejudiced. Yeah, he was a friend of mine. I loved him. He was a good guy. And I always went to, went to see 
See him when I was in Baltimore. And, uh, okay, he could, out, he could outrun Art Donovan. Anyone can do that. Oh, well, sure. Since, <laughs> but he can't out-talk him. Well, he could not run him to the buffet table, though. I think Donovan no, wins oh, that but, but Parker was quick, though. Yeah, he could play guard or tackle. He'd be all pro. He'd be in the Hall of Fame in both positions, just like Forrest Gregg was. The 57 college all-star game was coached by, you had Curry Lambeau going against Otto Graham. Yeah, he was a pain in the ass, Otto. What, was, what did Otto do? Oh, well, he didn't, he didn't like me at all. He didn't like Notre Dame. And, uh, uh, you know, here was a Heisman Trophy winner from the University of Notre Dame going to Chicago. Now, we had great quarterbacks on that team. We had Len Dawson and, and Brody. And uh, so... Uh, Otto was the offensive backfield coach, and Curly Lambeau, and I told him, I said, I'll never forgive you. You're, you're a number one pick in the draft, uh, going to Green Bay, and I don't start this game. I told him I was pissed off, and uh, he started Brody, and they didn't do anything, and uh, then he put me in, and I was no dummy. You know, I had Jim Brown, and they didn't even start Jim Brown. They didn't, he didn't start Jim Brown, and he's a former Cleveland Brown. <laughs> well, he was really pissed. Brown was. And uh, so when we got into the second quarter, I called Brown's play six times, and I threw him four flat passes, and we scored a touchdown. First one. <laughs> uh, Brown said, God damn, you going to give me a break a little bit? I said, nope, you're going to get it every time. <laughs> and uh, so at halftime, Brown said, I'm suiting up. He said, what? I said, what? He said, come on, let's go change clothes. I'm not playing for this guy. So and that wasn't Curly. Curly had, you know, he relinquished all his power to Otto on offense. So he said, I'm starting you and Brown at halftime. I said, I don't know about Jimmy, but I'm not playing anymore. I'm finished. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to get hurt, Curly. I lied to him, of course. He knew it. <laughs> and Jim Brown didn't play either. Brown refused to play. So we sat on a bench. Of course, we, we got beat in the second half, not because of that, but uh, they were a better football team. And, uh, then, and then you stole the coach from uh, Northwestern where Otto went when you took Eric Persig into Notre Dame. That's right. Yeah. And uh, Otto, Otto really uh, gambled. He was a real gambler. I, he uh, he could have gone to any college in America and coach, and he picked, what did he pick? Uh, Air Force, uh, Army, uh, uh, not the Army or Navy and that type. I forget what secondary Coast, team. Coast, Coast Guard. Where? Coast Guard. I can't hear you. Coast Guard Academy, is that where you ended up? I don't, yeah, I think it was the Coast Guard Academy. He really wanted to gamble, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Big time program. Yeah. <laughs> Unreal. He did that because he's going to get a good retirement. That's <laughs> all. So. Hugh McElhaney told us he made more money in college than he did in the pros his first couple of years. Well, he probably did. They didn't do that in Notre Dame, though. No, sir. No, that's been that's been as pure a program as you and you talk about college football. That's it. You can go to all these other state schools, and you know what you can find. But you, you don't get that in Notre Dame. Now, coming out of college, were you what? confident that you'd be the number one pick in the draft? Nope. I didn't. I didn't really care about. It. I knew it was going to be a high pick. It doesn't bother it's shit like that don't bother me. I mean if it happens, it happens. You know? I'm not looking forward to being number one this or that, you know. I've been very lucky in my career, you know, being being at the university and making Notre Dame and the Heisman and all that and then the MVP of the NFL. I couldn't have had I couldn't have had a better career in football, for heaven's sakes. And I got to got to play under the greatest coaches and Lombardi stood above the whole bunch, you know, the best guy in the world for that. So I look back on my career with great pride, and uh, 
uh, happy that I was a Green Bay Packer for those years. What was your first training camp like with the Packers? Well, it was fine. It was all right. Uh, yeah, I didn't know where I was going to play. Curly Lambeau uh, had, had set the stage for me, you know, go, arriving at Notre Dame, you know, not having played that much in the All-Star game with their questions and all the publicity. And, uh, and of course, I didn't get along with the coach. Uh, when I say I didn't get along, I didn't like him. I didn't think he was worth a shit. And he wasn't. And... Uh, uh, okay, that was Lyle Blackburn. Lyle Blackburn, absolutely. He played me half back one week, but he wouldn't tell me till Saturday. You know, oh, we're going to use you at fullback this week. We're going to use you at halfback. What kind of a coach is that? Uh, I didn't even work out during the week at the position that he was hoping for me to play. <laughs> so I had a very poor rookie year as far as I was concerned. I didn't enjoy it. Whatsoever, and I was establishing a pretty successful business here in Louisville. So I was actually thinking, "What the hell? I'm not going to put up with this guy all my life. You know, I'll just get out of it and go on into real estate." Uh, and then, of course, when Lombardi came, it changed the whole thing. And, uh, but before Lombardi came, you had well, he knew he, he had seen me play and everything, and he had already evaluated what I do, and he talked me into how important the halfback position was in the game, and I I knew I had ability enough to play halfback. Uh, not too many quarterbacks come out of Notre anywhere making All American who make All Pros at another position. Now, before Lombardi came in, and after Blackburn, you had Ray McLean, who had been a, a star player for the Bears. Well, he's... Who was, what was that? Uh, he should have gone into coaching, period. How did the mentality change when Lombardi became coach? Well, he took over. He was, he was disciplined, and he, he 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 came in that first day and told us who was the boss, and we were going to do it his way, or it was the highway. You didn't enjoy it? Get your ass out. And um, we all bought into it, you know, after what we had been through the first two years. When I was there, it was ridiculous, you know. So uh, I was uh, I was ready to hang him up, and uh, he talked me out of that and said I could be a hell of a football player in his, in his offense. And he told me how he was going to use me throwing the football and running the football. And he said, I think you're athlete enough to uh, block. So right now you're my halfback, and if you don't screw it up, uh, you, you're going to be successful in this league. And I, and I believed him. But Lombardi was fortunate in that the Packers – had some talent on that team that he came in. You had Bart Starr, quarterback. Sure, and, uh, absolutely. We got more guys in the Hall of Fame. You all don't even know that, but I'll tell you, we got 11. Now we got 12. And you should have 13. Name me, name me one team's got 12 guys in the Hall of Fame. No one. You have hit, no one. You have that's, you, team. That's right. <laughs> and you should have 12 with Jerry Kramer. We should have. That's absolutely ridiculous that he's not in. He was better than all the guards in the league in his day. What caused him not to get in to this point? Because of, uh, <laughs> because of, and he's not in the Hall of Fame, Paris. He should be. See, he should have kept his mouth shut about killing uh, Jerry Kramer uh, because Karras was sensational. He was the greatest, one of the great players I ever played against, period. You know, he was unblockable. If Jerry Kramer couldn't have blocked him, he was the best guard in the league, and he couldn't block him. And uh, But you shouldn't hold that against one guy all your life. Some of these reporters, they, they just show you they don't know shit about football. So they Alex, keep him out. It's ridiculous. So Alex, they kept me out. Listen, if it wasn't for a guy in Chicago named Cooper Rollo, and he went up to the guy in Baltimore. There was a guy in Baltimore who used to solicit votes against me. Solicit them against You don't want to keep your mouth shut when you got a vote. You don't need to talk to anybody else. It's kind of an unwritten law. 
uh, with the guys who voted in the Hall of Fame. And there was a, this guy was adamantly against me. Now, there's somebody who has been adamantly against Jerry Kramer. And just because he had a hard time, he, he'll tell you. Yeah, I had a hard time against Alex Karras. He was the best tackle I played against. Why not? You know? There's other tackles he'd take care of her in the Hall of Fame. And uh, this pisses me off that Jerry's not in there. But we got 11 guys off that team in the Hall of Fame. No team can even come close to that. And uh, you had a guy block for you by the name of Jim Taylor. Yep, just got on the phone with him. Yep. And he was another reject, you know. He was another reject when he when he came up. Vince took him, and he'll be the first to tell you, you know. Lombardi was kind, Lombardi was some kind of coach. He lost one playoff game in history. No one's ever going to do that again. I, I guess you're right there. I didn't even know that, but you're, yeah. Yeah, he's special. And I just talked to Gifford yesterday, and you'd get the same kind of uh, interview with Frank Gifford to get for me. Oh, I know, exactly. Except Frank keeps insisting that he got that first down in that 58 championship game, and Raymond Barry and Gino Marchetti said he was short. They did laser analysis. His knee went down, and he bounced up. <laughs> I don't remember that, so it's hard for me to comment on, comment on it. But uh, I, I don't know. It's a flip of the coin. <laughs> you got to look at it yourself to guess. What I don't get is, okay, you, Kramer deserves to be in. How did Dave Robinson get in over him? Is it because he's on the <laughs> Hall of Fame committee? Who's on the Hall of Fame committee? Dave, Dave Robinson. He's on the board of the Hall of Fame. Has nothing to do with it. He should have been. He was unblockable. You know, nobody blocked him. And uh, you know, he he also was on a team that had so many guys in there. You know, the writers get tired of voting for him. And I can understand that to a point. I mean, uh, but he was. Uh, believe me, I had to go up and get a block against him. I knew what kind of a linebacker he was. I watched him practice, and nobody was as good as he was. You know, I've seen a lot of film, you know, in my lifetime, and uh, everybody has. You know, ESPN does such a great job, but you've never seen film of any football player like they had in that four or five minute thing on Butkus. It's unbelievable. It, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean. Thank God he didn't hit me like that. You know what I mean? I mean, God, he was running over people and it just absolutely putting a real smash on, on uh, most of the tackles. And, of course, it's the highlight thing, so, you know, uh, you expect that. But, I mean, he was uh, he's the best that I think has ever played. The best, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, you know, I played against Ditka. And, uh, uh, you know, there's no, there's no better tight end ever played the game than Ditka. I mean... Uh, but the poor, if you played safety against Ditka, you were in trouble. I mean, you had to always know where in the hell he was because mm -hmm. when Sarris would reverse his field, those poor safety and defensive backs down there, they better in the hell know where Ditka is. So it was kind of brutal. <laughs> so you, you, you'd watch the film, and all of a sudden Gail would, you know, switch, switch gears and go somewhere else, who incidentally I've always... You know, I said when he first walked off the field up in Green Bay at Lambeau Field, I grabbed a hold of him and I said, the, "I said, Gail, if you you got to work hard, stay straight, baby, because you're going to be the best football player in, in this league." Period. And uh, he did turn out to be that. If he hadn't gotten hurt, uh, uh, I still think he's the best runner I've ever seen. Period. Without even, you know, not, nobody's close. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you weren't too shabby yourself, yet. No, but it was. I was a different type of football player. I'm, you know, I was called upon to block a little bit more, you know, in our offense. Yep. Jimmy wasn't a bad runner either. Absolutely. So, uh, but but Budkus, I'm going to tell you a great story about the Bears. This is a true story. A lot of people don't know that Lombardi first took a look at Budkus his first game in the exhibition season. And he's going over Budkus. He's, uh, he's a little bit deep. Look at him. He's back there about six yards. 
He's six yards deep in middle linebacker. Now, he's going, now I know he makes the tackle here, but the guard misses him, the tackle misses him. But yeah, he, yeah, he kind of upset the whole app. But you know, we're going to be able to take care of this guy. He's too deep, and and he's he he doesn't get over there real quick. I know he got there and he stopped the play. Well, well, that you know, we were leading the league in rushing at the time, and I would run the ball about twelve or thirteen times. Jimmy would run the ball about twenty-five times. And we were gaining about 200 yards a game rushing. Mm-hmm. And uh, we played the Bears this first game against Dick. And uh, I ran the ball, oh, about 13 times. I gained about 12 yards. <laughs> uh, Jimmy ran the ball 22 times. And he normally was leading the league in rushing at the time, about 150 a game, 140. A game. Jimmy ran the ball 22 times and gained 44 yards. You had a great... Yeah, uh, Bud just made like 24 tackles. <laughs> I mean, look at that defense, uh, Paul David Spader. You had Doug Atkins, you had Obradovich on there. Right, absolutely. You had Butkus. You know, and before that, we had to face Bill George. So, you know, we were kind of used to pretty good middle linebackers. George was one of the great linebackers of all time, for heaven's sake. It played before Dick. Yeah, but, but anyway, that team, Doug Atkins was unblockable, you know, and... Uh, that first game, after Lombardi saw that, he said, look, the guy, I don't, I, he he was sitting back there. You missed him. Forrest Gray, everybody misses this guy. <laughs> he said he must be something special. And that's what Lombardi said to the first time. And, of course, what the hell he did prove he was special. He did. And that, the, the film that I saw last week, the damnedest, uh, you know, film on a football player that I've seen as a linebacker. He killed people. Yeah. Now, Paul, I saw that same film. Did Did Butkus ever miss a tackle? Because in, in those highlights, it's like, bam, I never saw bam, him, bam. Highlights, he's not going to miss a tackle. <laughs> yeah. you know, but uh, I'm sure he, if he would have had to tackle Sears, he would have missed. Sears would never let him tackle. I'll tell you that, because yeah. Sears was something. Oh, people he... don't realize what a tough son of he, I saved Nishki's life once, because uh, Sears you know, he broke his ankle. Nitschke broke his ankle. Uh-huh. Never forgot. He said, I'll get him. And uh, he dared him outside uh, up in Appleton, Wisconsin. And, of course, Nitschke wouldn't go. He ain't going to go because Sarah said he killed him. Yeah. I saw him hit a few people, and, I, and it, it worried me to death. I thought he killed a guy on Rush Street one night. I mean, he <laughs> made a remark about his girlfriend. And, and, Caceres unloaded on him, and his face disintegrated. Oh. He just disintegrated. And I jumped down, and I pulled him off of the guy, or he would have killed him. And, uh, uh, I mean, he was unbelievable. Oh, nobody, man. Nobody as tough as that. Nobody fooled with 